thing. All right, well, I, I get to, uh, a treat today. I get to be on with uh, uh, somebody I think I first met soon after your uh, Christianity for the Rest of Us came out and had you out to speak at Phillips Seminary. Um, and this is Diana Butler Bass, uh, who is no stranger to a lot of us because I don't know if there's a denominational convention within the main line and I'm sure a few others that uh, she hasn't been to as a teacher or preacher at some point. Uh, and uh, she is a best-selling author for a number of books. I mean, for religious religion writers to make it into Harper One, uh, for anything is a, a fairly significant accomplishment. Uh, and uh, uh, her list of writings include titles such as uh, 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 The People's History of Christianity, uh, which sounds a lot like Howard Zinn's title, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and something of that kind of more popular, you know, how, how Christianity has worked out at a, uh, a more uh, common person's level. Uh, and um, uh, Christian for the rest of us, which I think uh, was just great in, in showing people that, you know, the main line isn't dead. Uh, and in fact, there's a, there are a whole lot of congregations at that point that were in fact finding ways to thrive without aping what the various um, megachurch uh, uh, folks on the religious right were doing. Um, and then the, uh, a series that I, uh, of books that I think all, I mean, for me, they all share a sense of um, uh, the spirit is alive and working in the world in all kinds of ways, um, uh, not completely apart from the institutional institutions of religion, but not limited there. And, uh, um, after religion and um, grounded, um, and and uh, grounded is a book. I'm going to also say um, I really resonated with what. Uh, with what you did here, uh, what, what you did in Grounded, that more, and maybe it's because we're similar age, uh, and it's got a kind of station in life where you're seeing, you know, that there's just, a, there's a whole lot of uh, uh, connection we have to dirt, uh, soil, sky, water, uh, the, the neighbors far and, far and near uh, that uh, has strong spirituality to it. Um, uh, grateful, which is a, I'm almost finished with, uh, which is a fine meditation on, on uh, gratitude as uh, uh, as connected with grace and its centrality in human life, quite different from the quid pro quo of gratitude in the Roman uh, world or the um, some of the contemporary world also uh, and the like. And uh, I just learned uh, in looking up Diana's books that uh, uh, one of her first books, if not, if, was it your first, Broken We Kneel? Uh, it was my second trade book. So okay. There was a book called Strength for the Journey that came before that. Right. But it Strength was very journey. early. Um, uh, and Broken We Kneel is all about faith and citizenship and its interaction. And it was originally issued as we, Diana and I were talking right before we got on the call. Uh, or the recording uh, that uh, after 9/11, um, but it got reissued last year, uh, and and because this is the field that I've been trying to uh, write in uh, and contribute to since my um, in my last years as president of Phillips, but especially since my uh, uh, taking a sabbatical and trying to start the Center for Religion and Public Life, um, how we as religious people show up in public. Um, and what our motivations and are to do it. Um, and I'm going to let you start talking here in a, in, in a moment uh, um, bec uh, because I got I, I have some questions to ask. But I do want to say that one of the uh, uh, a couple of the traits uh, of Diana's writings that I have most appreciated is not only that she spots trends. There are lots of people who spot trends, um, but also she spots counter trends. Uh, uh, so that, you know, somebody says, well, you know, spiritual but not religious is an empty category that's really heard in the church. And Diana comes around and says, well, you know, I, I understand that from an institutional perspective. However, there's other things going on here. And let's take a look at that again. Um, uh, and the whole business again with the mainline narrative, uh, you know, the following, uh, uh, yeah, we've all been, as far as looking at any denomination, we've all been in some version of numerical decline since the middle 1960s. 
um, as a denomination, but that doesn't mean that there aren't congregations that are finding their way. So I really appreciated uh, uh, your calling attention uh, at times to, now let's, let's take another look here. There's, there's something of, of value for us. So thanks so much for being with me uh, for a few minutes today. Oh, I just love that. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful explanation of the work that I've done over the last 20 years. Yeah, and, uh, so yeah great contributions. That's great contributions. It warms my heart. You can tell I grew up Methodist. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right, among other things. You have, that's, the, that's part of the spiritual journey that one learns by reading any of your uh, books, that you, you've, um, you have been on a journey yes. uh, in, your, in your life, and you've done a great job of writing about it. So what brings us to this moment is, is that I'm teaching this, this online course, uh, um, open to the public, uh, and I'm doing this course because I'm deeply worried about the state of democracy in the U.S., not just because of what I see the present administration doing, but this has been building for some time uh, and, um, and all. So I also can see, and as, especially in all the reading I've, I've I've, I've done over the last few years now, and I see so much more uh, than I had before, how insufficient even the democracy we've had is, going, is and is going to be for becoming um, uh, what we ought to be, with, you know, the, the world's first genuinely multicultural uh, nation. Uh, and our democracy has not been sufficient for that. And I think that uh, uh, this moment of racial reckoning is, is uh, uh, this era. In fact, it's not a moment, an era of racial reckoning is just one of those evidences. Um, I think the Christian right, uh, which has dominated my public, my, my ministry for the last 40 years now, is, is detrimental to democracy. Um, I don't think there's a support for democracy one finds in the Christian right. Um, and I've always wanted people of faith and spiritual commitments and moral grounding to be intelligent contributors to a more just, compassionate, and, and hospitable nation. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes me wonder, for the rest of us who are not the Christian right, what can people of faith and spiritual grounding from our traditions contribute to regenerating democracy that's going to be sufficient for the challenges this nation, and in fact, the world needs to meet as we move into the middle of the 21st century. And I'd really love to hear any thoughts you have on that. Um, I, I suspect that some of maybe what you've seen in, and, and reported on your writings is also evident, is already evidence of, well, here's some efforts at trying to regenerate, um, but also your hopes and what your imagination uh, how, how in your imagination this might play out for how can we help, we people of faith, help regenerate our democracy? Oh, that's such a huge question. And th there are ways in which the question is something that I've already been answering along the way in the, the books that you talked about at the right. beginning of the recording. Um, you know, I think about Christianity after religion, and while the focus of the book was on the church, you know, what's going to happen to Christianity with all of these demographic changes was the first sort of step in that project. And, um, you know, I suggested that Christian theology and Christian life would be reordered uh, mm -hmm. in how we... Uh, belong to one another, what does it mean to be human and people of faith together, uh, in how we practice our faith, and then finally in what we believe. And so, so the focus was that demographic shift, but it was on, on theology, spirituality, mm -hmm. and Christianity. Mm -hmm. But there's this under, <laughs> you know, really powerful undertow in that book. It talks about the political implications of mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I can tell you that for years I've gotten angry emails <laughs> about how political that book is. You know, people say, oh, I'll pick this up to read a book about church. And then it winds up being a book about politics. 
So I, I think that the questions that you ask have been bubbling around in my awareness mm -hmm. for quite some time. And um, I've been trying to answer them. Mm -hmm. So to, to get there, I think that it's first of all important for me to say what I think is happening to Christianity amid all these changes, including the, the demographic and political changes. And um, that is, there are new options that are coming to the fore. Mm. And some of them are coming to the fore very uh, loudly mm. and mm. with uh, very significant proponents. And so you have, for example, the Benedict option, I would say is right. the biggest alternative to some of the stuff that I've written about. Yep. Um, and so that's uh, uh, Rod Dreyer, right. uh, who I believe converted to Catholicism. I think uh, that's being, right. From being a Protestant of some ilk. And um, he has suggested that we fundamentally, we Christians fundamentally withdraw uh, from the political process and set up alternative communities. And, um, you know, when, when I first read that, I thought, well, what's the Benedict option about that? That sounds like the Stanley Hauerwas option. It does. <laughs> <laughs> There's similarities there. There are. There are real similarities. Yeah, different I think politics, but similarities, yeah. And I think there are cross currents of influence um, yeah. on, on both of them that leads them in a very similar direction. And so there's, that's the, I think that's one of the suggestions that's really strongly emerging, even in the old main line. Yeah, be Christian not, apart from the political process and form our own communities because the world's going to hell uh, right. quickly. And you see a lot of people, um, you know, say, well, I don't know if I'm gonna vote or uh, both political parties are bad or mm -hmm. what have you. And those are all sort of representatives uh, representing that impulse of, I think, withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, the second impulse I see is to rebuild the institutions so they are able to restore some place of authority in the larger culture. Mm -hmm. And this takes, again, a couple of different forms. There are very conservative types who argue, for example, well, if we just um, you know, straighten up our own houses, if we are theologically more clear, if we say that this is Christian doctrine and nobody can cross these boundaries, we're going to be able to, to reemerge um, with a strong message. And they usually want to reinstate in some way, shape or form, some level of hierarchical right. um, authority. Right. And I've heard that being articulated everywhere from Eastern Orthodoxy and American Roman Catholics to, I've certainly heard it around Methodism. Yes. I, I think I first heard the fir it first um, from Presbyterians um, mm -hmm. when I was with a, this was years ago before I'd even published my first book, a group of Presbyterians, I was at a conference in New Mexico and they were sitting around saying, you know what really America needs is our tall steeple churches back and they talked about the need to rebuild those tall steeple churches and to recreate the image of the 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 powerful intellectual mm -hmm. pastor mm -hmm. preacher mm -hmm. who is the center of moral mm -hmm. community and so that's that's a slightly different version of it than the catholic mm -hmm. version but it still is a version of it mm -hmm. um so, so I see that. And then I also see this really other one that, that you and I are probably closer to. And that is, well, there needs to be a religious left that's an answer to the religious right. And I, I'm well aware that you and I have lots of mutual friends um, who would say that that's exactly right, that we have to build out um, a sort of a religious movement that counters the influence of the religious right over the last 40 years. And, you know, I have more sympathy with that than I do with the first two. Um, but I also think that there are sort of flawed assumptions in that. Mm -hmm. um, one is if you're building a movement to counter a movement that was fundamentally built on fear and hate, you wind up right. mirroring fear and hate. Right. right. Um, and that's classic 
sort of Rene Girard is that when you desire to be like the thing you aren't, you wind up actually mm -hmm. being it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so I worry about that mm -hmm. a lot um, mm -hmm. as, a, as an option. So, so that kind of leaves us the, to your question. You know, see, this, I, I, I think we have to sort of be very clear about what's out there mm. um, as already, there's already at least three paths mm -hmm. that are theologically laid down mm -hmm. for being church in a pluralistic democracy and for dealing with this, this moment. And I don't think there any of them are right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's a dilemma yeah <laughs> yeah you'll <laughs> notice i kind of went hmm. yeah <laughs> right right yeah and, and so it, there's a major reason why i don't think they're right and the major reason is because you know my my fundamental training is in history mm -hmm. and i and that's always my fallback um, when I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the world around me, that's the sort of tools mm -hmm. that I employ. And so as a historian, there's one simple thing about this moment is we've never been here mm. before. Mm -hmm. There has never been a moment exactly like this one in the history of Christianity. And some mm -hmm. people say, oh, well, you know, the early church. Mm -hmm. No. That mm -hmm. is not true. Uh, mm -hmm. The early church moved from a culture where there was no Christianity, mm -hmm. Christianity mm -hmm. being a very powerful minority movement that attracted enormous numbers of followers and then challenged a pluralistic empire. Right. That is a far different situation than Christianity in West at least still within living memory there are still people alive today who remember when christianity when it was okay to use the word christendom and nobody would look right. at you like you were right. crazy right so so the idea of the the power and uh, and and really the glory of western christendom was what we have known for so many centuries in the west and that's now going away and the church is having to live differently in a pluralistic society and will of course um in that new position be challenging the political environment in which we mm -hmm. live mm -hmm. but that's very different than the early church because sure. nobody hanging around in the early church had any memories of jesus had any memories of the theological sort of stuff that shaped generations of people. And so in effect, I, I often think right now of the United States, we're rather like Europe, is that um, there is this memory of Jesus, this architectural memory um, in the case of the United States and Canada I think in particular, there's a lived memory still um, of people's experiences of being in that culture. There is also uh, the memory of the stories and the, you know, the holy days still haunt us, um, even as secu secular holidays. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have all of this Christian stuff that's all around us all the time. And for enormous parts of the population, even when they don't understand that it's within them, it still is. Mm -hmm. And, and so the work that I think that I have been trying to do, and you're the first person I think to ever ask me this in public is to capture that sense. What does it mean to be a community that has really lost status mm -hmm. in effect at the end of, of its history? Mm -hmm. And then with that loss of status, 
how do we carry memory into the world around us and do two things with it. One is to renew it. I mean, I think that a huge part of my work is mm -hmm. literally standing mm -hmm. in the public square, reminding people of Christianity and what can be good of good about it, why it's mm -hmm. important, why it's important. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's that piece, the, the memory piece that even Christians have to, I think, go with because our memories in many cases are very faulty. You know, I, right. I oh my gosh, right. the things I see people claim on social media as the church has always believed or something to that. Right. It's just, it's shocking actually. And, and that some of it comes from clergy is even more shocking. I, I literally spend, and no, no insult meant to Phillips, but I, I sometimes spend as much as a tenth of one of my days thinking to the, what are they teaching in seminary? You know, I, I, right. my own denomination in the Episcopal church, I, I literally do not know what they are teaching regarding the history of Christianity in seminary. Right. And, and especially, maybe especially in the U S we, you know, the, the adage, um, history is whatever has happened in my lifetime. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that's correct. Is it, it, an apt adage? Yeah. And, and that, that, we can't we can't have that lack of memory right now right. we have to really dig into that memory piece right. and so so that's what i feel like so much of my work is is about digging into that memory of the stories memory of the tradition memory of the practices and um you know just sort of even memory of the ways in which our most immediate ancestors navigated this change which, mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. is an interesting story and somebody's gonna tell really well, I hope a hundred years from now. So there's that piece, but then there's also the piece of then how does the church, while it's doing this kind of memory and sort of remembering work, mm -hmm. um, stand in a political environment. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, um, that's, that's complex. And right. I, feel like, I feel like every day, I feel like every day I actually am experimenting with some new aspect of that on social media or through something I'm writing in the newsletter or in a conversation with um, religious or political leaders. And right now I, I'm working, working with them. Um, I am working with the Biden campaign. Um, and most of my job there ha it seems to have been, and I'm not paid by them. I'm doing this all for volunteer, um, but I've been you know, helping to advise, you know, some mm -hmm. of the people who are uh, working with religion in mm -hmm. the campaign. Mm -hmm. And it, it, most of it is sort of pointing out things that they haven't noticed to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just suggesting, you know, sort of different approaches to how to tell the stories and how people hear differently um, in this day and age versus even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's really interesting that, I, that, that that's a place where I'm just, I'm living right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and trying on different things to you know, try to, and, and hoping um, some level of that pathway will become uh, more clear, even to a person mm -hmm. like myself who spent a lifetime thinking about these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the places where um, uh, you and I think fairly similarly from at least from what I've read of, of your work is around the need to be able to talk about politics and church, not necessarily electoral politics, but politics in its, its broad sense of how power is shared and how our policies and practices uh, are either inclusive or exclusive, whether, you know, contribute to an illiberal democracy or liberal democracy as, you know, classically defined and the like. Um, and I think what I've seen for years now and heard testimony of is the way that uh, that's a lot of people in pastors in particular are fearful of that um, because of how divisive it becomes almost immediately. Because in my opinion, anyways, um, uh, the, the kind of um, 
uh, uh, angry, vitriolic rhetoric of, of declaring the orthodox and the heretics uh, is very much a part now of the political you know, polarization and process um, where we don't have opponents, we have enemies. Um, and we don't have a rhetoric that's uh, Christian flavored enough or religiously flavored enough um, of our politics to be able to bring that political polarization into the church and try to transform it into something different. And yet that's exactly where I hope that people of faith can make some contribution is, can we develop a different way of talking about this that keeps, keeps us at the table and keeps us you know, human with each other uh, uh, without, um, uh, again, turning opponents into enemies. Yeah, and I think that the, the, the three sort of virtues that I keep returning to, it, it, it's in all my writing, but I'm definitely returning to all of them now, every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, the first one is um, humility. Yep. Okay. And that goes back to when you talked about broken we kneel, people say, well, where did that come from? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Broken we kneel is the opposite of united we stand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always thought of united we stand as kind of full of, you know, hubris, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas in those days of 9-11, after 9-11, I thought, well, what if we just all stayed on our knees for a while (laughs) and really prayed about this Mm -hmm. and really understood Mm -hmm. and could listen and feel the level of humility, not humiliation. Right. But the level of humility that emerged from the rubble of the towers, um, which we didn't do. Um, but nevertheless, I, I always had a hope for that. And, mm-hmm. and so, so I, I've always, for at least 20 years, um, I've been writing about humility uh, as a sub theme in mm-hmm. all, of my, mm-hmm. all of my work. And then compassion, of course, love your mm-hmm. neighbor uh, mm-hmm. as yourself. And um, that's, uh, to me, baseline Christian ethics. If your mom missed teaching you that one, um, I'm not quite sure what church you went to or what your mom was thinking. Right. <laughs> right. And you've referenced Karen Armstrong's work about the Charter for Compassion and Compassion yeah. Cities Initiative and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so there's a, I mean, there's just an amazing amount of work around right. compassion as a central right. theme, not only of Christianity, but as a unitive theme between worlds. Absolutely. And so then hospitality. Yes. Um, that is, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the single most theme that's emerged most strongly in my last um, three books and the book I'm writing now is this collision uh, in faith between people who want to build walls and people who yes. want to set tables. Right, right. And I will go to my grave and have already preached probably two or 300 sermons on the centrality of the table. And this I know that I do not have to harp on when I'm in rooms full of people who are from the Disciples of Christ tradition. And, and um, you know, what I see, for example, in my, my own tradition as an Episcopalian, um, start out Methodist, became Episcopalian mm-hmm. along the way. Um, is that they're, we're having an argument right now about the table. And there are literally people, and I, who would ever believe that this was an argument that we'd be having in the 21st century, who want to put a wall around the table? Hmm. Hmm. A new kind of a kind of stasis? I mean. Yeah, I mean, literally, I, uh, just this week on Twitter, there were a whole bunch of very young Episcopal yeah, priests yeah. Yeah. who were arguing about whether or not if someone came up to the communion and it's all mute right moot right now with the pandemic but um right. if somebody came up to the the railing for communion and you didn't recognize them should you find out at the railing whether or not they're mm-hmm. baptized and um I mean, literally, they sound like Missouri Synod Lutherans. No offense to the Missouri Synod Lutherans. No, that's, that's but, exactly where I went, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, I keep thinking to myself, what are they going to ask for, communion tokens next? 
Um, and then, lo and behold, on Twitter, somebody <laughs> suggested something almost exactly yep. communion like tokens communion well. tokens. Yep. And so, um, you know, it's just, uh, that's the part of that shocking lack of memory that, I, that I'm talking about. Uh, but also, you know, that's, a, that's really, to me, almost unbelievable is that people in the age in an age of pluralism when the table should be standing there welcoming everyone which it does anyway which that's the image from the new testament mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um there are still christians who in a time of pluralism say no 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 um we have to put a wall around the table and i i could not be more theologically, spiritually, and morally opposed to that opposed than to that. I could possibly yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. So, so those three things, humility, compassion, and um, the table. And it's really nice of you to mention Grateful because Grateful is a deeply political book. And it's it also is. a surprisingly, I think I call it theology in the world. Mm -hmm. Because what it does is it takes theology, and there's a lot of theology in it, it takes it out of the setting of the church, not because I hate mm -hmm. the church, mm -hmm. but because I'm trying to take the church's richness there and move right. it into the world. Right. And so gratitude is actually the thread between humility, compassion, and hospitality. Huh. Yeah, yeah, good, good. I need to let you go because you've, you've been very generous with your time, but I wanna make sure uh, that uh, also have an opportunity. If people wanna connect with you, I know that um, through your Facebook page, but also you've got some uh, weekly kind of a uh, little deeper writing you're doing. Uh, why don't you say a word about that before we go? Yeah, I started a, a Substack newsletter. Substack's a new platform with no ads and no trolls. And nice. that's one of the things that attracted me to it. Um, and it's very focused. It's centered on readers and writers and provides a way for readers to connect with their favorite writers in a deeper uh, sort of medium. And so I just started it this summer. I've been loving it. Um, people for this class, I wrote a piece uh, just a few weeks ago called uh, More Than God Talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it lays out the sort of the five hallmarks of how to analyze what's going on in religion and politics right now. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. got tens of thousands of views. And um, so I'm doing some political writing over there and I alternate it when it gets too heavy with politics because everything is so painful right now. Um, I make sure I put in a really good dose of things like I had a few weeks ago, an interview with Anne Lamont on gratitude. Yep. And, it, and so, yep. so I do stuff like that, uh, you know, or occasional kind of a mini sermon or reflection, just to kind of lighten the mood, make sure people are staying on board, giving folks hope, um, keeping people refreshed. So yep. it's called The Cottage on Substack. You can join me there. It's completely free. And um, in the next two or three weeks, I'm going to be creating time on that platform where I'll actually get together with readers. And so mm -hmm. I'll announce a time in advance, say, hey, I'm going to be there such and such a night at such and such a time. Come on in, ask me anything. Great. Yeah. Great. So Thanks I'm really, so much, looking, I, I love, the, you know, what can you say? We're doing the best we can with all these new technologies and some of them are pretty astounding. So, yep. Yep. yeah. Appreciate it. You take it's care. Great to see you, Gary. Same. Best to Richard. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm.